Medieval texts are manuscript, so each one is unique. This also means, of course, that each one had to be written out by hand. The image below is from the opening folios of the manuscript that we are transcribing here. It is manuscript Biblioteca Nacional de España, Madrid, manuscript 12837. It is a manuscript of 148 folios written in the first half of the 14th century, so it's about 700 years old. It is one of the earliest manuscripts of the Historia de España, and we know that it is a copy of the royal manuscript known as E1, which was written in the scriptorium of Alfonso el Sabio, the learned, in the early 1270s. The first impression you have on seeing the manuscript is probably related to the colours. The material on which it is written is not white, like paper. This is because it is parchment, animal skin, which has been prepared especially for the purposes of making a book. The different sides of the animal skin, flesh side and hair side, are also slightly different in colour, so when you turn the page there is a change of colour. Parchment leaves were gathered in a way that meant that, for example, a flesh side always faced another flesh side, and a hair side faced a hair side. You can see this as we turn the page here. You can see on the right hand page that the opening has become wrinkled. Parchment is not as pliable as paper, so these wrinkles remain for a long time. Of course, this means that parchment is also a lot tougher than paper, so often it survives better than paper books do. All of these things mean that the reading experience is different to what we are used to with paper or digital books. Another early impression most readers have for the first time concerns the layout of the page and the disposition of the text on the page. As you can see, the text is laid out in two columns. This is a very common way of organising manuscripts at the time. In the Historia de España digital project, we are interested not just in what the text of the manuscript says, although this is of course what is most central for understanding it and academic study, but also how it is presented and therefore understood at the time. We compare all of the manuscripts of the Historia to see how they are compiled, how they relate to each other, and also to examine the differences between them. We would like your help to identify all of these things so we can draw some conclusions about how people read and understood medieval texts. In addition to the writing in black or brown, the most common additional colour which really draws the eye, as you can see, is red. The chapter headings or rubrics are picked out in red so anyone can instantly spot where a chapter begins. This is also helped by the illuminated initials, typically in red or blue and of different sizes depending on the section they introduce. These instantly draw the eye to the textual divisions the authors or scribes wanted to highlight in the manuscript. This is also true of the pilcrows, which are something akin to a paragraph marker. You will see something similar in Word documents. The reading experience is therefore different to that of reading a printed book. The opening of the text reads, Aquí comienza la corónica de la general e grande historia que el muy noble rey don Alfonso Fijo, del muy noble rey don Fernando y de la reina doña Beatriz mandó hacer. But as you can see, the experience is rather different when we read it directly in the medieval manuscript. You may find it difficult to recognise words and the script may seem hard to read at the outset but you will find that you soon get used to reading the handwriting. It is very regular and your eyes will soon adjust to it. There were many different handwriting scripts. The one used in the Historia de España manuscript we are transcribing is known as a Gothic book hand and it is very clear and regular. Many of the letters are shaped just as we still write them now. For example, the letters E, P and N. Here is the word bueno. It looks just like we would write it today. Here is the definite article LA. However, some letters look a bit different to how we write them today. For example, here is a Z. And here it is as part of a word, FITZIERAN. For some letters, what we call the ascender, 
the part of the letter which goes above the average size of the font does not point straight upwards as we usually write it, but can be oblique or diagonal. For example, have a look at this D. And some letters have a descender, the part which goes below the line of the rest of the letters, where we would not draw one today, such as the R here in the word entre. Scribes sometimes wrote the letter I with a descender below the line, so it looks more like our letter J. See here in Metier, where the I looks like the R above with its descender. But sometimes they wrote an I that looks just like we draw them today. Here is Piezza. In this example, you can also see the C cedilla, still used in French, Portuguese and Catalan, which was used to make an T sound. Something else to look for is the long S which can easily be confused for an F. Here is the word sobre. Notice also the round shape of the letter R, which is different to the long R with a descending stroke we saw earlier in the word entre. And here is fasta, hasta in modern Castilian, showing both an F and a long S. Not all of the S's are long, however, such as this one here. A V at the start of the word can look a little different to our modern eyes too. Sometimes the initial stroke is prolonged. Here is the word bino. As you can see, the shape of manuscript letters does not always coincide with the current shapes of letters. In other cases, you can see how the same letter has variations. For example, the familiar S and the long S, the R with a descender and the rounded R, the D with a diagonal or vertical ascender, the short and long I. In all of these cases we transcribe using the same letter, S, R, D, etc. with the sole exception of the long I, which we transcribe with a J. If all of this seems a lot to take in, remember that you will not be transcribing from scratch, but rather correcting an existing transcription from another manuscript, E1 from which this manuscript is copied. Your task is to revise the transcription of E1 so that it matches this manuscript. Looking at the transcription of E1 can often be a big support in helping you to decipher the handwriting in the manuscript you are transcribing until you get used to reading it. Let's talk about abbreviations. As we all know from note taking and sending text messages, it is frequently more time effective to abbreviate writing. Medieval scribes did this all the time, and not least because before the 15th century, the material on which they were writing was expensive to produce and like paper. It therefore made sense to include as much text as possible into each manuscript. It takes a little effort to follow the use of abbreviations, but when you do, and with a little help, you can read very quickly. These are the most common abbreviations used in our manuscript. We will show you more examples in Module 3, but for now, we'll show you the ones you'll see most often. The character that you will see most often is this one. This is the Tyronean sign, which represents the conjunction E, E or ET, depending on the language used and the time the manuscript was composed. It emerged as a shorthand way of writing Latin ET, the other most common abbreviation is the macron, or general sign of abbreviation. It appears over, usually, a preceding letter or letters and signifies that the following graphic sequence has been abbreviated, usually UE or N. By far the most common usage of this abbreviation is in the word K, which looks like this. Sometimes the scribes also abbreviate K even when it is internal in a word. So you will also see, for example, aquel and aquello written like this. Equally important is the use of the macron to indicate that a following nasal consonant has been abbreviated. Thus, the word grand, meaning gran or grande, sees the N replaced by a macron over the preceding A. 
Scribes frequently use the macron with the value of n at the end of words. So you will see this often at the end of verb forms, as in fueron and fuesen. But they don't always do this, as you can see in the word pusieron. If you've been wondering why we call the project the Historia de España with two n's and not España with an ñ, this is because the palatal nasal was originally represented in Castilian by double n, in Portuguese by nh, in French by gn, Catalan by ny, etc. As a shorthand, scribes started to abbreviate the second n to give ñ, and so the ñ was born. This example also shows another common abbreviation, the superscript I. As you can see here, the superscript I represents UI in the word quien, although it would be more accurate to say that it represents the syllable qui. Just when you think you understand these abbreviations, you realise that the same abbreviation marker can represent different syllables. In the next example, the verb form prisieron, modern prendieron, we see that the scribe has used the standard abbreviation for OM at the end of the word and has again used the superscript I at the beginning. This time though, the combination of P and the superscript I represents the sequence PRI. It can also represent IR, as in the example of virtud. So when you transcribe for our project, you have to make sure that you choose the right expansion. We'll explain how in other modules. Another common abbreviation is what looks like two superscript dots, but which is in fact the letter A, sometimes with a little line above. Here, the scribe has used it with the letter Q to represent the sequence qua in cuando. However, the same abbreviation used in combination with other letters can represent different syllables. Thus, in combination with T, it represents the syllable tra in the word otra. A superscript O in combination with a T represents the syllable tro, as in otros and troya. We can also find a superscript E as an abbreviation, as in the example sobre nombre. Yet another common one is the superscript hook. It can represent re, as in siempre, but also er, as in tener. Very occasionally, it can represent what we think of as ir, as in decir. Another of the most common shorthand characters is the p bar, that is, a p with the descender crossed. This is most frequently used to represent the syllable par, as in the case of the conjunction para, or internally in a word, as in partes. But it is also used for the syllable per, as in epercebir. A particular favourite of the Astoria Digital project is this character. Here, you can see that it represents us, as in the possessive adjective sus, or at the end of the name Venus but you will also see the same abbreviation used to represent the syllable con, as in this case, which is the word consejo. To conclude this brief introduction, we should point out that these are not rigid rules, that scribes are human, and that sometimes they do their own thing. Often, they will use their own abbreviations simply to ensure that all of the text fits into the line in question. So when we say that the macron is employed to abbreviate nasal, here is an example where it is used for the vowel e, as in razones. And note the double r at the beginning of the word. So, what do we want you to do? We would like you to help us expand our knowledge of the Estudio de España. To do this, we need to be able to compare the text of the Estudio as it was written in Alfonso Scriptorium and that of all the other manuscripts. We are interested in all aspects of each manuscript, so we want to record any changes of any kind, graphical, abbreviations, corrections, notes, etc. In the transcription tool which we have created, 
you will see this screen. On the right is the text of the Alphonsine Chronicle, manuscript E1. And we would like you to rewrite this text so that it looks exactly like the image on the left. The base text on the right may then help you to understand the manuscript text in the image. But remember, it is not quite the same. And we want to mark all of the particularities of the manuscript that you find. Thus, for example, we would like you to mark that the text in the image in red is a chapter heading or rubric, so it looks like this. In the next three modules, we will show you how the system works and what elements we would like you to mark in your transcription.